Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're now in public session. Uh, before we go anywhere, I'd just like to remind members who have mobile phones, would they either switch them off or to the flight mode? It's not just the inconvenience at the meeting, but it affects the recording and broadcast of the proceedings here. So mobile phones, if you could either switch them off or to the flight mode. I also wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to that effect. Where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Uh, your opening statement submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting. And members are also reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'm pleased to welcome the Institute of Professional Auctioneers and Valuers this afternoon, uh, Mr. Eamon O'Flaherty and Mr. Pat Devitt. Uh, you're very welcome, and as I said, your full submission has both been circulated to members and will be on the website afterwards. So at this stage, if you would like to make your opening statement, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and Deputies. <coughs> I'd like to make a short, a small short statement, which is uh, will contribute to about five or six minutes, and uh, the president of IPA, Eamon O'Flaherty, who's here with me, will come in at the end of it for a small bit, and we want to leave as much time as possible for questioning for the full uh, submission which we've made. So, to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, deputies. IPA is delighted to take up this invitation to appear before you this afternoon, and we hope that in our submission we can help in some way with your work in tackling a very difficult and complex problem. I wish to congratulate you, Chairman, and members of the Committee on your work to date and to acknowledge the urgency which the new Dáil has given to this issue, even before a government has been formed. The whole area of housing and homelessness is a very complex and interrelated one. The current housing crisis displays to a dramatic degree how each cohort of society is interdependent. A policy change impacting one group has a downstream effect on another. We believe the work of your committee could be a landmark in mapping out the way forward. Firstly, a brief word about IPAV itself. With the Institute of Professional Auctioneers and Valuers was founded in 1971 and now represents 1,000 members across all 32 counties. Our main aim is to represent our members through education and other means that are very much includes contributing to important debates such as this forum in drawing from our vast knowledge and experience out on the ground. I proposes this committee are outlined in the submission, which I expect you all have, as your chairman has said. I would like to highlight some of the key ones in a short time available to me. In a market functioning normally, one should be able to rent, buy or sell a home. In the current market, choice is diminishing and social change has been foisted upon us. The kind of social change is impacting most severely on younger age groups and those with few resources, but it is also hurting the economy. This is happening at a time when there are over 300 vacant sites alone in our city, some 150 acres of land that should and could be brought into production without delay. Housing policy is so critical to the social and economic well-being of any society, but particularly one such as Ireland, with severe effects from the financial collapse, that it needs a whole-of-government approach. In this regard, I have strongly encouraged the new government to appoint a full cabinet minister with responsibility for the sector. This minister should be supported by a cabinet subcommittee on housing and planning, which could bring together all of the relevant departments. Secondly, IPA recommends the setting up of a consultative property council comprised of all stakeholders with varying and divergent views, so as to advise the new cabinet minister. We believe the process should be all-inclusive and rapid, with the government arriving at a plan for long-term sustainability in the housing market, with short, medium and long-term goals. IPAV is ready and prepared to play its part in such a council. As a representative body for auctioneers and estate agents, IPAV is keenly aware of the abnormally low numbers of transactions in the housing market. There were 43,428 residential transactions in 2015, 
and this included multiple sales, equating to a national turnover of 2.2%, considerably below the 4 to 5% that could be considered as normal. Despite the population projects, new bills this year, 2016, are in course to fall far short of the required 20,000 units and are projected to be more in the order of 13,000 units. A large proportion of these new bills will be comprised of one-off houses in the country, not in the cities where demand is greatest. Ten years ago, in 2016, new bills were at 93,000 units and we were led to believe that 93,000 units were required. This points to the industry capability to build the quality now required of 20,000 units per annum. So why so few new bills? There are a number of reasons which need to be tackled urgently. There is widespread acceptance that the cost of building is a major impediment to new house construction. The lack of availability of building finance at reasonable rates of interest is a particular impediment to house building. The new government needs to incentivise small and large builders by making building finance available at interest rates between, we believe, 1 and 3 per cent. We propose the Department of Environment, Community and Social Government be empowered to offer finance to builders who wish to participate in an agreed price building scheme. This would be made available through a separate building fund. I believe that this new development contribution rebate scheme intended to boost house construction in 2016 and 17 by returning 80 to 100 per cent rebate on development levies paid needs a number of amendments, including its extension to all cities in Ireland and to all builders who want to take part in the agreed price building scheme. We believe small builders, the mainstay of Irish construction, are not receiving equal treatment with their larger counterparts. It is estimated that the current rate of VAT of 13.5% adds an extra 15,000 to 17,000 to the price of a new property. We believe that a reduction of 9% would further incentivise building. Such a VAT reduction has already proven itself in the tourism sector and could deliver a saving of 7,000 euros per house. IPA believes that while the mortgage lending restrictions introduced by the Central Bank in 2015 were well intended and in principle are important for long-term economic stability, they are excessive in some respects. They are disproportionately impacting first-time buyers in urban areas, especially in the capital. We believe the loan-to-income ratio for first-time buyers should be increased from 3.5% to 4 and possibly 4.5. We were led to believe when these were introduced in February 2015, the new measures were not destined or designed to steer or limit house prices, but to restrict lending. We welcome the statement from the Central Bank Governor this week that from, 2016, from June 2016, he intends to seek submissions on the macroprudential policy before he does a final review. I will now hand over to our President, Mr. Raymond Flaherty, who will talk uh, about rural regeneration. Thank you, Chairman and Deputies. IPAV has long had a major concern about the decaying condition of the majority of our rural towns and villages right across the country. Many of these towns and villages uh, contain many boarded up former residential uh, commercial premises which have no viable future as a commercial entity. The right kind of radical intervention could breathe new life into these decimated towns and villages. We estimate there's approximately 1,500 of these towns and villages right across our country. We would like to see a tax incentive scheme introduced to, confer, to convert non-viable commercial residential buildings into solely residential use for owner-occupiers. Already our members have identified three or four hundred of these properties throughout the country that would be suitable for such a scheme, which would have no expensive outlay for the government and would, would be a win-win economically, socially and politically for us all. IPAV welcomes the Live in City initiative but believes it is too limited, focuses only on the regeneration of the historic centres of six cities, Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Galway, Waterford and Kilkenny. We believe there is a clear need for a nationwide scheme which will be open to all our rural towns. Otherwise, such towns will continue to languish and disappear before our eyes. We believe such an initiative would be win-win for every member of the community, Parts of South Wales, for example, have been struggling with the issue of regeneration more than a century after the, pit, the first pits closed. They desperately want to reverse the chronic legacy of deindustrialisation, but much promised regeneration has had little success with the region topping league tables of poverty, ill health, education and inequality. 
Again, we believe the issue is needed to be part of a whole of a whole of government approach, coordinated, and would bring together all the existing incentives. Exam examining how they could be coordinated, identifying how these could be filled with relatively small financial outlay, and the setting of specific achievable objectives, especially including yearly targets for local authorities and any implementation plan with time frames for each objective. Thank you. Thank, thank. All the proposals we wish you to consider, for which I do not have time to include here now, are NAMA support for Irish governmental institutions, such as housing agencies, in acquiring properties, a review of hindrances to our planning system, and the introduction of e-conveyancing to speed up the closure of house sales. These are some of the proposals we wish to put before your committee, Chairman. And our President, Eamon O'Flaherty, and myself are happy to take any questions, and hopefully we'll have some answers for you. Thank you for your attention. Gentlemen, thank you very much for both of your opening statements. And before I just open to, to the floor, just one point I'd like you, Mr. Devitt, maybe to explain or to expand a little. Uh, you talked about the loan to income ratio for the first time buyers increasing from 3.5 to 4 or 4.5%. And I suppose I'd like to know how you came to that and what's underpinning it, with the concern we would have that all it might do is in, inflate prices and the affordability for the first time buyer, uh, might, that that situation might not improve. Um, we have a consideration there, Mr Chairman, as well, and what we're asking to do, it would only be that there are specific uh, balances built behind the increasing of these, uh, of these LTIs from 3.5 to 4 and 4.5. We believe at the moment that there are, the price of building, the cost of building, uh, is there's a massive difference between the cost of building new properties and the cost of selling second-hand properties. We see the building costs as no, nobody seems to know how much it costs to build a property. We've been asking for a long, long time to work out these figures of where the actual building cost, and I'm talking about the building costs now, I'm not talking about the ones we can see of the development levies and all of those things because they're very see-through and we can see where they are. We've been asking, actually I've questioned uh, the Minister of Finance about this recently at a meeting in Port Leash and I've written to him about it because we're very, we, we need to see how much it costs to build a house. There's nobody that can actually say in Ireland, apparently at the moment, how much it costs to build a house. We've asked not numerous times where the costs are. We, in our proposal, you'll see that we've came to the conclusion of 100 euros a square foot to build a property. And we believe that if those figures, which seem to be, from talking to builders throughout the country, small builders and large builders, that figure seems to be a reasonable amount of, amount of money to build a property. And if that be the case, we believe that uh, the difference, the levels that those houses can be built at, that young people who are looking to buy properties, regardless of the fact of how much money they're earning, aren't able to be able to buy those properties on the 3.5% or the 3.5% LTI that we're speaking about. So in those cases, we believe that those figures should be altered and should be changed upwards. I suppose just why there was a slight smile when you said that we had the Construction Industry Federation and we had chartered surveyors this morning and we were probing this very issue in terms of the actual cost. Um, the committee is expecting further documentation from the surveyors in relation to actual cost. And I suppose up to your point in time, uh, most of the suggestions were around how can we actively reduce construction costs rather than increasing the loan to value. So. That, that's where that, the context of that. I'll open the meeting to the floor, so who would like to start off? Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Chairman, <clears throat> and I welcome our guests, and uh, thank you for uh, giving us their time uh, in this important uh, issue. And uh, to go on to the, to, to, the, to the last item first, can I, can I, can I ask, uh, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, whether or not you have um, identified exactly, for instance, um, the true building cost of a house at €100 uh, Euro per, square, per square foot. Uh, I have information to the effect that uh, it could cost considerably less than that. That would mean building by direct labour, but it would be considerably less than that. And I know that there are those who say it's considerably more than that. So somewhere in between lies the answer to the query. What it is, I don't know. But what would you say to the, the notion that used to prevail once upon a time, that the building costs were roughly one-third for, for building inputs, uh, materials, one-third for labour, and one-third for, for profit? What was, that was the old adage uh, once upon a time. So I'd like your comments on that. And I, can I mention as well, <coughs> uh, correctly you identified an issue that affects younger people. It is younger people. They're generally under 30s or around under 35s who are 
most seriously affected by the lack of available housing and their families. Can, can, I, can I ask uh, whether or not uh, any consideration might be given to uh, the Housing Finance Agency loan scheme that, was, that existed in the 1980s, where I think it was three, four times, five times the, the income was delivered by way of a loan. It worked extremely well, they were, but they had to, the, people, the applicants had to qualify on the basis of their income. They were on the local authority housing list, so it was catering for uh, a size of the market. And the last point I want to make is a point I've made before. I think that, uh, and I, I, it came up in, in your submission, uh, I'm not in favour of over-reliance on housing bodies, voluntary housing bodies. I believe that they are the cause of the problem. I believe that reliance on housing bodies took away from the local authorities the responsibility for providing housing for a fairly large segment of the population. And that included, included not only the people who are on the council housing list, but also people who qualified for local authority loans in the past, all of which has been, has been, has been, been sidelined in, in recent times. To get a local authority loan now is virtually impossible. Uh, and about 10 different agencies have to adjudicate why that should be, I don't know. But the point I make there is this, is there, 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 you may have some thoughts on how to replace that system that was available during the 80s, when there was relatively little money around as well, Mr Chairman, but where houses were provided for people on the basis of their ability to pay. It might have been a small amount of um, monthly repayments, but they, 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 it was, the market was catered for. Deputy, I'll take uh, one or two more before we uh, Deputy Function. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, just to say, firstly, uh, we all, I think, probably agree in relation to the mystery of the cost of building a house. There's a lot of talk about...